and welcome to the first of the uh, Export Supply Chain Services Industry Briefings for 2023. My name is David Lawson and I lead the Ag, Food and Consumer branch uh, here at Austrade uh, and also the Export Supply Chain Services Unit. Um, I'll be hosting this virtual meeting uh, today and I'd like to kick off by uh, acknowledging the traditional custodians on the land from which uh, we are here presenting here in Sydney, which is the, the people of the uh, Eora Nation, uh, the Gadigal people of the Orient, Eora Nation, in, and in the same spirit as elders uh, past and present have passed on information uh, about the land, about their land. We uh, join with you from all over the country uh, and acknowledging the, the original custodians of the land on which you're based. And, and in that same way in which uh, information was passed on, we look forward to passing on to you uh, and sharing uh, what we are learning about this important topic. Um, for anyone who is uh, on the call, who is unfamiliar with the program, let me just uh, explain what the Export Supply Chain Services is. Uh, it was an initiative uh, launched by uh, the Minister for Trade, uh, Don Farrell, in August last year to coordinate supply chain insights through intelligence gathering, um, research and analysis to help stakeholders um, understand uh, the, uh, the new norm, as it were, for this um, volatile uh, area in which um, capacity has been diminished and, and rates are very expensive as as uh, we all struggled to uh, to supply into international markets. The Export Supply Chain Services shares the insights that we gather through three uh, primary uh, instruments. Firstly is the Supply Chain Snapshot, which is uh, a fortnightly report alternating between sea freight and air freight uh, that covers the latest global supply chain developments. The snapshot's available on the, on the Export Supply Chain Services webpage as well as via email for subscribers. And if you've not subscribed, we encourage you to do so. We also run periodic public webinars such as this one to update industry uh, on the work of the program and the current supply chain, supply chain challenges. And we're thrilled to acknowledge that there are 300, over 360 uh, registrations for today's webinar. Um, and we meet regularly with industry associations to discuss the discrete uh, supply chain uh, issues facing exporters uh, in, in particular industries uh, and as represented by the associations. And this um, contributes to uh, uh, us uh, being able to uh, you know, share our insights with those industry associations, but more importantly, to, to gather that information uh, and pass that on to you uh, and of course to uh, to governments, both uh, federal uh, and state. In today's briefing, we'll be hearing from uh, Michael Byrne, who is the uh, Export Supply Chains uh, Services Principal here to my right. Um, and we're also really pleased to introduce uh, Ashley Brosnan. Uh, Ashley's uh, a director in the uh, economics and analysis uh, team here in Australia. Ash is going to uh, provide us with an update on and the current economic environment and how that impacts supply chains uh, and, uh, and what we can expect from uh, 2023 from, uh, from an economic point of view. Uh, we've got to finish up with uh, uh, some open discussion and, and, and question and answers. And to facilitate that, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the bottom of the slide in front of us at the moment, uh, which gives you the instructions about how to log on to slido.com or, or, or uh, perhaps you might use it through an app on your phone. So, so download and, and register on slido.com using uh, the hashtag ESCS. And at any time during the conversation today, uh, we uh, strongly encourage you to just uh, enter your, uh, uh, your questions uh, and um, we will, as a panel, uh, answer them in the, in the question and answer um, session at the end. I draw your attention to the fact that uh, this is uh, being recorded uh, and anything that you do register in, in Slido um, is um, 
you can either do read, uh, ask your questions anonymously or you can put your name to it, um, but that will be for all to see. And, and um, that, that gives us the opportunity to have a, uh, a really free and open conversation. So um, without any um, further ado, um, I would uh, like to hand straight over to Michael and uh, ask you to tell us what you're seeing. So good afternoon, everyone. Well, we might go to the next slide straight up, I think. Um, it's great to see everyone. I'm sure we can't understand how it already is the 6th of February. Where did the first five or six weeks go? Uh, look, I think that it's been fairly predictable in regard to what's happened with air freight in the last couple of weeks. Uh, first of all, we had an early Chinese New Year. And we knew that there'd be a, a, a slight build into that. Then school holidays finished um, later than usual in most states around the 30th or the 1st or even the 2nd. So last Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, usually school goes back around uh, just before Australia Day, but, but because it fell on a Thursday, no one went back on a Friday. So we saw air flight numbers stay high um, for Chinese New Year, where there's always a bit of a peak, and then a little bit longer for school holidays, but then they've gone backwards. Now, that is not unpredicted. That is not, not normal. That is normal. And then we had uh, severe weather in New Zealand. So it dropped back probably a point or two higher than we thought. We had it got to as high as about 76% on around Australia Day of historical pre-COVID international flights uh, coming back to Australia. That's dropped back to 73%, just under 73%. I I'm not concerned about that. Uh, there was school holidays where Australia Day fit how early New Year, a Chinese New Year was, and then really poor conditions. And you might have seen even the video of Auckland Airport flooding and the water coming down the escalators there instead of people. So not concerned about that. We're waiting for the published data for the Northern Hemisphere flying season. It could be out now, but it, or it's very, very close. Uh, starting for the 1st of April, and that will be the defining uh, document which really is going to happen uh, in our winter. We know in our winter flight numbers go down. That will, that will continue. We could see an uptick, though, and if you look at the announcement from the Chinese government in about two weeks ago, every, basically every flight in, into Australia from China is at 100% capacity on passengers. 100% capacity inbound. There's supposedly 40,000 students, if you read the media last night and the Australian, I think this morning, it's around 40,000 students who have to be back at school uh, this month um, ready for the start of university. Uh, I know that when I sit on the, the Senate of the University of Western Australia, they're very excited about all their Chinese students coming back. There's just nowhere to house them because uh, they've already given away those dormitories predominantly to Indian, Vietnamese and Indonesian uh, students in Western Australia. So there's a lot of things happening. Um, AF freight rates are elevated and remain high. Um, again, Oceana jet fuel prices per barrel, which is 18% higher than December, went up to $122 a barrel, as you've seen there. It's 33.6% higher than the same period uh, in 2021, actually. So, not 22. So, we've gone up another 18%. People are saying, why aren't freight prices coming down? Well, you've got two things working against you. A very, very heavy uh, passenger loads and very high fuel prices. And the fuel is 24 to 27% of operating costs, depending on which sector you're flying and the length of what you're flying. So I'm not expecting to see air prices come down much. Yes, around China's New Year, we did see uh, air freight prices come down about 10%, but that's 10% on three times. So mm -hmm. it, it's not 10% of uh, coming down back to pre-COVID. And I think that if you remember Air Vice Marshal Margaret Stave and myself 
and a lot of the analysis, we said that it would never get back lower than one and a half to two times. And I think we'd still be all of that view. Uh, we're at three times. Uh, some places are still at four times. Uh, fuel we couldn't anticipate because of the Ukraine-Russian war and, and what OPEC have been doing. Um, and that's going to continue. What is really interesting here, um, apart from the Chinese airlines all announcing that they are going to be doing increasing flights from late January, which has already then started, is that we are seeing many more smaller, wide-body planes come to Australia. That uh, historical long-haul flying into this country was done in very big planes. Jumbos, they've gone the way of the Dodo. A380s, probably going the way of the Dodo, except for Emirates. Uh, 787s, 777s, A350s. What we're seeing, though, is that airlines are being very uh, considered and subtle in their economics and are trying to maximise their return while minimising their cost they don't want any four-engine planes if they can avoid it. They want smaller planes that are at 100% utilisation where they can drive yield. When they're doing that, though, there is less and less tonnes for air freight. Um, so if you see, the number of, even when our planes are going up and we're at 76%, actual number of wide-body planes is decreasing. It's decreasing. So the average was 67% wide body pre-January 2019. We're only at 60% and that is going down. It's not going up. Now, there's a couple of things happening there. Um, and we did this analysis and put it out in one of the uh, snapshots just before Christmas. If you look at uh, Boeing and Airbus's uh, build slot program uh, for 787s and A350Es, they are a long way away. To fill the backlog of orders is about a decade if those planes were ever delivered. But they're turning out now 737s and littler planes and Embraer have also come into the market. Uh, and you might have noticed that Virgin and Qantas are both, both buying Embraer for short haul, uh, local Australia. There's no chance of getting any freight on them, not even mail. So we're seeing a real change in mid short to mid distance uh, international freight where we're not getting big planes and on those little planes there is no chance of freight. Uh, the order of priority is um, bags, uh, mail, the reverse order, sorry, it is spare parts for a plane, then mail in the national interest for each airline and then bags. And if you're on a little plane and you've done those three things, there's no freight, basically. Um, despite global air capacity, and a very interesting line then, global air capacity being just 3% now below pre-COVID, Australia continues to lag behind, as of last week, at only 73%. So the world is <clears throat> going much stronger than us. What does that reflect? We're a long way away. <laughs> We're a long way away from everywhere and there's not enough aircraft and there's not enough pilots and airlines are just maximising profitability. Um, I know people say, well, Qantas has made 1.4 billion, 1.5 billion, 1.6 billion. I agree, that seems a lot of money, but don't forget they lost 6 billion over the two and a half years before that. Mm. So it's all relative and that means airlines are focusing on yield and will continue to do so, at least in our view, till the end of 2024. Uh, and if you look at uh, IATA, while freight will decline by 4.3% across the world, there's no way that uh, prices can come down because there's not enough planes being rolled off the assembly lines. We'll move to sea freight. If we go on... Um, Really, really interesting. I think sea freight, uh, again, um, really tough for Australian exporters. <laughs> and if you look at the Shanghai index, I think prior to COVID, let's, let's call it 1800 bucks a box, pick a number. 
went on between Shanghai and the west coast of the USA, uh, went as high as $20,000 a box, uh, is now down to about the levels or maybe a little bit higher. And, and if you remember, uh, the federal government did a big piece of work through, I think it was Boston Consulting Group, through uh, a, Camilla, a lady called Camilla Ergoff, who is probably one of the world's experts who lives in Greece on sea freight. And she said that over the long term, sea freight will still be 30 to 50% above pre-COVID levels because after the 10 years prior to 2019, the big shipping companies won't allow a negative IRR or an IRR of 1.9% to a negative 1.9%, which is what they did the 10 years prior. Um, so there's some really good things happening. Schedule reliability has risen to 56%. Um, why is that? Um, two things have happened, I think. Uh, one is that volume capacity has collapsed uh, or volume to, volume has collapsed between the West Coast, uh, the China and the West Coast by about 18%. So in November and December, container numbers were down 18% on even prior months. And that should not happen uh, when you have Black Friday, Thanksgiving and Christmas. And to the UK, it was down 8%. Uh, so with a lot less volume, there's a lot less... Uh, schedule reliability because people aren't stuck at port. And then we saw really good improvement at um, congestion levels where ships were at anchor either to load or unload, which was as high as 13.5%. That halved in one month. So that gave us a lot more reliability and gave us a lot more capacity, which then drove the prices down. Um, we're at 80% reliability, average days of delay 4.1%. Both of the closest to pre-COVID we've had in approximately three years. New vessels combined at a cumulative capacity of 2.3 million are due to be delivered global shipping fleets across 2023. I'm not as interested in that. Um, don't forget the new emissions targets became law on the 1st of January and ships uh, will be, and we've seen the first of new old ships going to the scrap heap in Bangladesh and India to be beached and be cut up. Uh, why are they doing that? Because there is a disproportionate amount of fleet now over 25 years old. And the older ships have been kept in the last couple of years as high as 32 years. They're just too old, inefficient, their fuel consumption's poor, and they have too much emissions. And the only way to make them work is to slow their steaming time, which then puts more costs back into the supply chain. While the overall order book stands at 7.5 million, and the most orders are from Maersk, who are now the largest shipping company in the world instead of Mer uh, MSC, sorry, instead of Maersk, um, I think you're going to see a lot of ships scrapped. A lot of ships are going to be scrapped. And that comes out of the IMO stricter efficiency rules, and look at those numbers. Shipping emissions have to come down by 40% and then by 70%. Shipping life is around 25 years, so those decisions are basically being made now or have to be made, and some of them can't be made by 2030, so ships have to go. Um, significant shortage of 20-foot containers. We've had a couple of big meetings with the big shipping companies, um, and I thank them for those discussions. It's fairly clear that in the long term, they're going to a more modulised model uh, to reduce their operating costs. They want to standardise costs around the world to give a more seamless operation to their global customers. Uh, and we're going to struggle with 20 footers. We're going to struggle also with food grade containers. And as we know, our uh, restrictions on food grade into the country are not as high as our food grade out of the country. So around 40% to 50% of all boxes that come into the country for um food are rejected by us to put food in to go out so there is nowhere near enough boxes particularly as agriculture is growing at such an alarming rate and if we're going to deliver on ag 2030 as a bipartisan agenda item to move from say 78 billion to 100 billion this is going to be a really tough issue um there are some views and i don't know if i have one in regard to restrictions in china will negatively affect operations of air and sea 
um, due to more workers isolating, or there will be a real flow of goods. I don't have a view either way yet. I think we need to see what happens. I think it's too uncertain. It's very speculative. By the end of December, um, we've seen big reductions in... This will be my last point. Big reductions in import costs. We haven't seen much reductions in export cost. Why? Um, cotton it has been going off its chops um, and they've been hitting records on cotton, particularly out of Brisbane Airport. Grain, I was in Western Australia all last week talking to grain people. They have done record grain numbers, not only at 22.7 million for uh, CBH on its offtake, which is way above anything they've ever done and the season had it finished. They put over a million tonnes into food boxes, which they've never done. They broke a million tonne, uh, is my understanding. Now, that has put a lot of pressure on boxes availability, but also kept prices really high on export. And then you have continual things that are making export very expensive. You have record copper, record iron ore, record coal, record LNG. Now they might not be in our commodity space, but they're making port access very difficult, particularly in those mixed ports like Fremantle or a mixed port like uh, Port Kembla. They're mixed ports. So they have coal, cars, they have grain, they have containers, they have uh, break bulk all in the same port, which is making those some of those ports difficult because our exports, as we've seen in balance of payments, are very, very strong. I think that will continue. Um, and I don't see much relief on export sea freight. It's going to come down. We've been at highs as fives and six times. It's going to come down to the three times and the two times. I actually don't see it in this cycle coming down much lower than that. I think that... We're still hopeful that sea freight prices will come down even more materially by the end of this financial year when there's a lot more ships that have come out of the 2.3 million uh, as per one of the points at the top. But those ships are back end loaded uh, and by then we will be into peak season again. And But that should alleviate a lot of the sea freight export costs. But it won't be till the end of this year and air freight should stay higher till at least mid next year when we start to see some more wide body planes. And in the interest of time, I will stop there. Quick question, end of this year or end of this financial year? End of this calendar year. End of this calendar year. Calendars. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Uh, always some amazing uh, food for thought there. Uh, hopefully people are uh, are uh, quickly putting in um, in their questions in the export, in the uh, in Slido, just to remind you, slido.com, hashtag, ESCS, which is short for Export Supply Chains, and uh, look, wasn't it a delight to hear uh, that rather rare uh, economic uh, uh, calibration that uh, that Michael quoted about cotton that it's going off its chops. <laughs> um, what a uh, what a great calibration! <laughs> We're going to throw to Ash now, who, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is from our economics and analysis team. And uh, I'm not going to put to you that you might be able to quantify what off its chops actually (laughs) means, Ash, but... I'll I'll get the team working on it. (laughs) Good on you. Uh, Really looking forward to your presentation. So uh, straight over to you, Ash. Yeah, thanks, Michael, and thanks, David. Um, So I think um, to set the frame for my presentation uh, today, I think it'd be good just to think about where we were 12 months ago. Uh, And then I think that will help frame where I'm going in my current sort of thinking. Uh, So 12 months ago, if I did this sort of presentation, I'd be talking about uh, the high levels of demand, uh, particularly for uh, goods, um, as people sort of came off the back of Omicron, they were keen to get out there, they were keen to purchase, they were flush with cash, they were importing bicycles, cars, they were redoing their kitchens. Uh, And so what that created was... Uh, a demand pull inflation where you know everyone sort of wanted things they had the money uh, and prices were rising as a result at the same time uh, there was cost push inflation so uh, a, a constra- constrained supply of all these things that people wanted as a result of COVID still operating through a lot of production facilities uh, constraint in shipping as we've been talking about 
Uh, and so we really, for the first time in 40 years, had a incredible high levels of inflation um, across advanced economies. Um, and then, of course, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine occurred at 24th of February, and so that sent uh, energy prices skyrocketing. So that's sort of where we were. Uh, what we've seen this year is a lot of that starting to unwind. Um, and so what that means is we're likely to see low growth um, and lower expenditure from consumers, uh, lower consumption, lower investment, and hopefully inflation will start to unwind. So if you just pop to the next slide, I'll unpack that a little bit. Um, so if we're looking for the next year, we're likely to see uh, inflation uh, um, beginning to decelerate across a lot of major economies, including Australia, uh, towards the end of the year. Uh, but we'll see, we'll see a recession, particularly in the US, the UK, EU and Japan. Um, manufacturing is starting to ease, and manufacturing is often sort of a leading indicator uh, for uh, the economy as a whole, and so we're sort of seeing um, you know, things like um, computer chips, um, really starting to slow uh, as sort of an indicator. Uh, US consumer spending has actually remained remarkably consistent and resilient over the last sort of 12 months, uh, but that's likely to slow um, in the first half of 2023, particularly as uh, you know, US consumers have been putting things on their credit cards, and um, given the slow real uh, wage rises um, and lower growth, it's unlikely that's um, unable to be um, sustained into the year. Um, and supply chains still remain vulnerable to shocks. And I think if I was sort of to typify what uh, this year looks like, it's sort of like a, a cloudy day with a chance of a storm. And so um, I think that might, that's something to sort of keep in mind that, you know, supply chains, whilst this effect that we saw this time last year is starting to unwind, uh, they still remain very vulnerable to sort of geopolitical and economic and financial shocks. If I can just pop to the next slide. So how do we, um, how do we unpack that? So uh, the IMF uh, released its World Economic Outlook last year, uh, last week, sorry. And so um, their kind of consistent view is that we're likely to sort of see uh, fairly low growth across most advanced economies, until, including Australia. They downgraded Australia uh, 1.9% to 1.6% this year. Uh, you'll see that euro area is uh, basically flat, 0.7%. Um, India still continues to grow very high, and they've um, grown at 6.8%. But um, overall, um, the, the world will sort of narrowly miss uh, a recession. Um, and so the world uh, growth is forecast to grow at 2.9%. And that's been particularly held back by the effects of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the effects of global money monetary tightening. Uh, there are some growth spots. India, as I mentioned, Vietnam still growing at 6.2%, Indonesia 4.8%, and the Philippines at 5%. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's a, I think a challenging year and uh, managing low demand, I think, will be uh, the biggest impact for business. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so central banks are acting incredibly aggressively against inflation. Um, and, you know, there's no really easy answers uh, for uh, policy makers. Um, they're sort of, uh, particularly for markets uh, in the EU and the UK, uh, they're kind of facing a sort of similar situation that many economies faced in the 70s, of incredibly high energy prices um, and, um, you know, a sort of slowing demand. And so there's, um, you know, difficult for them to sort of navigate uh, this in a successful way without seeing uh, significant declines in economic activity. But it's clear that central banks are single, that they're uh, going to continue to... Uh, raise interest rates over the um, coming sort of three to six months. Um, the signals, I think, from the US Federal Reserve is they'll continue tightening uh, until probably another three times until May, uh, and probably maintain those across 
the year uh, to really try and bring the inflation down. Um, as I mentioned earlier, despite this, US consumers have remained pretty resilient, um, but they've sort of done that via you know, dipping into their savings and their credit cards, and so that's unlikely to slow this year. And uh, whilst fuel and food prices have sort of slowed, those sort of price rises have slowed, uh, they could continue to remain uh, incredibly volatile this year. And I think we'll see, you know, the biggest impacts will be felt by households. Starting to see that a little bit in Australia, in terms of people um, feeling uh, tight with their sort of home budgets. Um, and um, I think that will be continue to be felt across multiple uh, advanced economies. Just pass me to the next slide, please. Uh, the China uh, economy is going to be bumpy throughout this year, I, I believe. Uh, firstly, um, coming out of zero COVID is going to cause a great deal of short-term disruption um, in terms of uh, you know, recovering production, um, and you're going to see you know, a lot of people still needing to stay home due to sort of being affected with COVID um, and the disruption to uh, mobility um, and people's confidence to sort of be out there um, getting back to sort of that sort of normal life. Uh, but it will be, a, a thing, I think, a, a source of economic growth for the Chinese economy and globally as Chinese citizens start travelling, uh, start going out, start uh, you know, going out to dinner. Um, so I guess that's a sort of one bright spot in the economy at the moment. Uh, the other challenge is um, we'll likely uh, see weaker demand um, as uh, weaker demand will mean a, a, a downward pressure on manufacturing. So um, that will, I think, be challenging for Australia, uh, particularly as you know, the sort of commodities that feed into the rest of the global economy um, sort of starts to slow. I think another sort of long-term trend for China is their demographics. Uh, they've had a, a long period of slowing productivity growth, and they've now reached, I guess, what could be termed the sort of peak of their sort of demographic uh, dividend, uh, and their population is uh, forecast to decline over the next decade, and their citizens are increasingly um, becoming older. Uh, and so the sort of growth that we saw over the last sort of three decades has sort of possibly come to an end, and the Chinese policymakers uh, face difficult choices in terms of how do they continue to spur and achieve the economic goals that they have. And I think, interestingly, we've seen with the zero COVID policy that they're increasingly willing to accept lower growth uh, as a trade-off to achieving their political and policy aims. Um, so the Chinese GDP is forecast to grow 4.2% uh, in 2023, um, but I think a lot of that will be in the back half of the year. We'll still sort of see quite a slow and bumpy uh, level of growth in the first half. Next slide, please. Um, so this, um, what we've sort of seen from uh, manufacturers across the globe is they're also reporting uh, much lower orders um, and um, high input costs and high um, order uh, sort of costs uh, are causing, uh, I guess, a, a real slowdown in production activity. Uh, this means that um, at the same time, I think Australia will uh, benefit from high commodity prices in terms of um, as an energy exporter, um, but I think we'll definitely sort of see much lower volumes over the next 12 months. Um, if we just pass to the next slide, please. Um, I think one of the great disappointments in the um, sort of world economy is the United Kingdom. Um, they're um, one of the major advanced economies, not just to have a recession this year, to actually uh, record negative growth. There's, their um, output is projected to fall 0.6% in 2023. The reasons for this are threefold. Firstly, um, they're really grappling with 
a high degree of public debt um, after uh, the sort of their sort of COVID um, pandemic restrictions uh, and the various subsidies that they provided. Um, they have incredibly high uh, energy prices, and that's you know I think just a, a major risk uh, for their recovery. And uh, they're also in response um, having to um, implement quite uh, restrictive monetary policies. I think a fourth thing, and it's not often talked about, but I think um, they've really lost competitiveness and confidence after Brexit. And I think that they're sort of going through a period of really having to sort of rethink what their economy is and how they kind of navigate you know, or you know, find new sources of productivity growth. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is the, the Global Supply Chain Pressure Index. So um, trade activity is, um, you know, decelerating sharply. Um, and you, you can kind of see that, in, you know, all those sorts of things I was speaking about before in terms of electronics, um, home furnishings, um, construction materials, that sort of trade has sort of started to unwind. Uh, but energy, food and commodity prices still remain at historic highs. Um, despite um, you know, returning to sort of their pre-COVID, um, I guess, volume levels. Uh, the WTO forecasts trade volumes to grow just 1% in 2023. And this is down sharply from their previous estimate from 3.4%. Um, and so um, I think, as I mentioned, supply chains, um, whilst they're sort of starting to unwind and that sort of real pressure and tightness that we saw this time last year, so really sort of slow. Um, I think they still remain incredibly vulnerable to the emergence of gene economic shocks. And so that could be um, the sort of escalation of the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, that could be uh, increased, sort of, I guess, economic or political decoupling between the US and China. Um, that could be, uh, I guess, a new uh, COVID variant or the sort of uh, real kind of difficult um, transition for the Chinese economy. And, uh, or it could be sort of a financial shock, like um, an increase in sort of corporate um, defaults and corporate um, closures as a, as a result of higher uh, interest rates. So um, yeah, I think it's, a, it's a, a tough year for business, but I think still uh, need to be an awareness of um, sort of the, the economic risk that are attached to that. Next slide, please. Um, so we've seen actually a, a, um, an appreciation of the Australian dollar over the last month. Um, part of this has been uh, the US Federal Reserve has sort of slowed its interest rate rises. And so that's meant that a lot of capital has moved to, uh, I guess, more risky, um, commodity exposed um, currencies like the Australian dollar. Um, they may, similarly, the, uh, Japan may end its sort of run of ultra low interest rates. They've really sort of committed to this sort of policy for quite some time, um, but I think there's growing awareness that they just can't sustain it. And so uh, Australia will probably experience favorable terms of trade as a, I guess, as a consequence of uh, an improved um, exchange rate, uh, but exporters will face quite a bit of difficulty in hedging against volatility. I think it will be um, quite a volatile year for uh, currency markets and um, difficult for businesses to try and navigate this. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I won't labour this point too much uh, because Michael sort of really hammered it at home, but um, you know, freight costs are sort of remaining still you know, well above their pre-COVID levels, uh, but they have, have come down from those peaks that we saw in the middle of last year. Uh, in, uh, importantly, um, a lot of the congestions that we saw, you know, say outside um, the LA ports, uh, that's sort of really um, declined now. Um, but as Michael sort of mentioned, I think it would be uh, take a while for some freight rates to return to sort of anything like the sort of pre-COVID levels. I think also, um, despite low unemployment, both in Australia 
uh, and the US um, and I guess increasing wage demands as a, as a consequence. Uh, this is meaning that logistics jobs are incredibly difficult to fill. And I think that's the trend that will continue this year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what does all this mean? What does this mean for business? Uh, so these are probably the, the uh, eight trends that I'll probably point to this year. Firstly, uh, business uh, will be very focused on reducing its costs and enhancing their, their competitiveness. Uh, that's perhaps maybe closing down um, unprofitable or uh, low return business. You see this in uh, tech uh, businesses recently. They closed a lot of their uh, low return business units. Uh, we'll see slowdowns across consumer and manufacturing. Uh, the risk of uh, ge geopolitics means uh, maybe a continued rethink of supply chains, uh, rising protectionism, and I think oh, you see across all economies at the moment, businesses to, and governments talking about um, supporting uh, production at home and protecting uh, production at home, and that I think will have an impact on global growth and productivity growth. Um, as I mentioned, un inflation unwinding. These risks uh, that I mentioned earlier uh, could really derail the global economy. Uh, retaining skills and talent will be a major focus, despite cost cutting. Um, and businesses will have to sort of think about how they maintain uh, talent in that environment. And the number of mixed signals, I think, make challenging, uh, make planning for the future incredibly challenging. So um, thank you. I'm happy to go in questions. Mm. Fascinating. Yeah, thanks, Ash. That's really, really useful, really insightful, and right on the money in time management too. So thank you both gentlemen. We've got 20 minutes or so for some Q&A. Um, and I'll just remind you that uh, some people have been asking questions on slido.com slido there, or, or via their the Slido app on their phones, remembering that the hashtag is ESCS. And we've actually had a couple of um, uh, questions come in from there, but I should draw people's attention. If you are using it on the app, there's a little thumbs up next to the question. And if that, in, that question uh, you find fascinating, uh, if you, you, you can like that and that'll go up to the top of the list. And there we have it. We have uh, three questions now from Tan, so thanks very much for your question. Are the shortest shortages for 20-foot containers for Australia only or globally? Um, <clears throat> my comment would be, well, tw people want to use 20-footers here disproportionately as a percentage of total movement compared to the rest of the world. So a lot of our inbound freight is light. Ikea or it's chairs or it's upholstery or it's other uh, consumer goods that are light. The majority of our exports are really, really heavy. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so people want to use 20s mm. because otherwise they have a, a lot of weight first cubic issues and then restraint in a 40 footer right. because there's too much airspace. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it disproportionately affects us because of our commodity mix mm. and our inbound, but no one wants to make 20s. Interesting. Um, is there an infrastructure issue there as well for, you know, that we can only handle or we're better handling 20 versus 44? Well, I think the issue will be as um, MSC, CMA, Maersk, all the others continue to modulise their business model to reduce their costs. Mm. They are going to put pressure on uh, ports and stevedores to be even more concentrated on 40 footers in the long term. Mm. You've got to remember we're 1.7, 1.8, pick a number, 1.6% uh, percent of global TU trade. Mm. We are a taker, not a giver. Right. So what's happening globally to modulise the supply system to drive down cost, mm. we will follow. Okay, interesting. Kind of a related question that I'm going to ask. Um, what about pallets? Uh, pallets, um, 
<laughs> pallets, any good uh, retailer will hoard um, because pallets are so central to their supply chain. Uh, you've got to remember that uh, Coles and Woolies and all the big supply chain people are driven predominantly by Walmart's model and Tesco and Woolies is very uh, linked to a Walmart model. Uh, Coles is more to our British model through or Tesco or um, a couple of the other white white coes and a few other people there um, are very delivered on very dependent on pallets because the back of store at a supermarket is where about thirty percent of a supply chain cost is in a retail. Mm. So if you notice how they've changed over time, uh, supermarket aisles and it's all sitting in boxes and mm. it's all sitting in basically a form that can be turned into a cube because mm. palletization requires cube, cubing. Mm. cubing, which makes a trailer more efficient, makes their warehouses more efficient. So there's enormous pressure on pallets. Um, then we have a lot of issues around how pallets are made. Pallets don't come from a native forest. They come from plantation forests, particularly out of Tasmania and Western Australia and and Victoria Shep are the number one, Loscombe the number two. Shep and Loscombe, if you notice, have been recently, they've done an acquisition or putting their businesses together in Asia because neither of them had scale. But there's a lot of problems with supply. Mm. Um, there's a lot of issues with even plantation uh, timber mm. and some of the environmental issues. Uh, plastic pallets are very expensive. Slip shooting doesn't work. Uh, except for refrigeration on short haul, which is predominantly used out of Tasmania. There is a, a shortage of pallets, but people are hoarding them. And there's also, as we always know, a black market in pallets. Uh, I don't see that getting any better. You, 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 you use the word hoarding there twice now. I mean, yep. that kind of has a negative um, connotation, but from that point of view... It's a very sensible thing. It's a sensible thing. <laughs> So, very sensible thing to do for retailers to increase their pallet inventory. Yeah. All right. So people call it hoarding. Pallets are inventory. Yeah. Um, as we all know, Shep and Loscombe are masters at charging for them on a weekly basis and higher fees. But it is about protecting their inventory of their product to get it to a supermarket. All the FMCGs use them. And what you'll find is pallets will even be more important as Woolies and Coles continue to automate their uh, national and regional distribution centres, which uh, Woolies have done in Mulgrave, Coles are doing in Queensland, and then Woolies are doing at Mitchenbury with the mega facility being built on the railhead. Hmm. Oh, sorry, not at Mitchenbury, Moorbank. Right, the, the logistics area there. Yeah. Terrific. Um, you mentioned Tasmania a couple of times, and we actually had a question at point of registration from the uh, Department of um, State Growth down in, in Tasmania. And just wondering uh, again for you, uh, Michael, any insights about matters that have additional impacts um, for Tasmanian goods suppliers? Uh, well, I think, I think first of all, the toll sea uh, road and TT line did a fantastic job over uh, Christmas and December. The weather was for them. Um, they hit their slots, from what I can see, extremely well. DSV um, believe they did a tremendous job. Um, and a couple of the other freight forwarders there. I think it was difficult with Cathay, you know, only doing those two flights. And I would have hoped that those flights would, um, there would have been more of those, for particularly for stone fruit and crustaceans. The big issue there to encourage... Um, more direct international flights is what the federal government and the state government, and congratulations to both of them, are doing to uh, harden and widen and strengthen uh, the runway and the uh, off loops at, the, at Hobart Airport. That mm -hmm. is the biggest single two thing the government can do there, and they should be congratulated. Mm -hmm. But that won't be online, I think, till maybe mid 24. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. Thank you for that. Uh, we, we're getting uh, quite a flow here of, of questions coming through on Slido and, and uh, one question that's already been answered, but just to reiterate in case people can't see. Uh, yes, these pres uh, questions, uh, sorry, these presentations and materials will be made available online afterwards. 
Um, and, uh, you know, if you want access, you can email at any time, uh, supplychains at austrade.gov.au and, and, and you can join our mailing list there. So uh, question here for Ash. Um, uh, hopefully, you, maybe you've seen some reports over the weekends about capital flows from China. So we've got mm. 100% uh, capacity of, of flights coming into Australia, mm. you know, zero going back to China. So there's a lot of people coming. They've got uh, piggy banks stuffed, um, you know, ready to start the school year. Yeah. Any thoughts on the impact of those capital flight, uh, you know, capital flight from China? And um, what do you want to take that on notice? Uh, yeah, I might take that on notice. I'd probably just point to there were some legislative changes a couple of years ago which really limited capital flows out of China, mm -hmm. um, particularly um, in, you know, I guess what it was termed non economic types of investments. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, the sort of you know, investment in real estate and things like that really slowed probably about 2018. Mm -hmm. um, whether you'll see an increased investment as you know, business people, you know, are able to travel um, and, you know, they're sort of looking for those sorts of FDI types of activities. Yeah. Um, I suppose, yeah, we have to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Good. Uh, we've also got a question here from Jenny. Is the European Union debating banning air freighted food, uh, brackets, from climate policy food miles perspective? So that's, a, um, I, you know, probably... We're hearing noise about this in relation to the negotiations with the FDA. I don't think there's a ban necessarily, but, um, you know, obviously air miles are going to be... There's, there's, there's more to this question. Let's. I'll just give you the whole lot. Is this likely to happen or is it just lobby groups making noise? Jenny also goes on and says, if Europe adopts this kind of position, do you see them using their influence and corporate footprint to push this policy setting into Asia? Why out of my pay grade? <laughs> and, uh, no idea, I'm not a diplomat, and, and all of you would know from two and a half years that I'm no diplomat. I will say two things. One is that uh, the Israelis this year, uh, last year, last year, last year, Israelis always ask, banned except military planes that had four engines entering their airspace. Mm. No other country had done that. That was a, a commitment to uh, reduce emissions. and. By doing that, keeping old aircraft that were gas guzzlers out of their airspace. Now, mm. no one else has done that. Mm. And then Schiphol, which is in Amsterdam, one of the largest airports in the world for transit traffic, particularly out of North America into different parts of Europe, uh, limited the number of older planes. And they, they put a, a grade in. I don't know how it's going because it was very controversial saying, you can have this many planes that are under five years, then you can only have this many planes that are five to ten, mm. et cetera, et cetera. And that was all about changing emissions. Mm. In regard to the specific question, I don't know. Mm. I just think those two things are interesting to show how the world's changing. Yeah, no, good good point. If I could comment then, perhaps from Australia's perspective, I mean, this is something that we have been monitoring uh you know, over some time, and it's not just specifically with Europe, but as uh, importers become more discerning uh, and, and um, you know, in places like Japan, for example, where the, the importers are really um, taking strong direction from their consumers who are voting with their hip pocket and, and insisting that, um, that, that they are getting access to um, you know, better quality product, so organic product. Uh, and I think we are going to see an increase in, you know, in the desire that, um, that, that, you know, air miles, for example, might be uh, included in the considerations of what consumers are actually buying. I mean, I remember years and years ago uh, when we first started exporting uh, organic wine uh, and, you know, there, there seemed to be a lot of interest from the Australian exporters in putting in organic wine into, into Europe. We were getting very strong signals, and I'm talking you know, sort of 15 years ago, that, you know, it, it, it is um, uh, by definition, you know, the fact that you've shipped an, an organic product all the way over to Europe is kind of defeats the purpose of, of you know, giving back, to, giving back to the globe. 
So, you know, we, we just need to be very careful and I think we need to be making sure that we are leveraging the high quality product that we can sell and we can manufacture and sell internationally and and uh, and leveraging that. I don't see it as much as an imposition, but as an opportunity that, that exporters can take advantage of. Um, moving on, um, are we seeing innovation in sea freight to support product generally uh, sent by by air freight, for example, horticulture. This is from Mitch Rawlins, a trade. I don't, I don't think there's much going air freight from sea freight. There's just not the capacity right. with these heavy passenger numbers. And I think apart from real high-end commodities, still a lot of those prices are out of reach for people. Mm. So they have to find ways to uh, manipulate or change the dynamics of their product to go sea freight. Mm. There's, just, there's just not enough air freight out of this country. Yeah, right. And and as we heard, that's not going to change in a hurry. Yeah. Very good, thank you. Um, Aaron McGoldrick asks, there seems to be big impacts on shipping due to the emissions targets. What effect will a jet zero type model in Australia have on air air freight, given we're an island nation? Well, I'll have to take that one on notice. That's... Mm -hmm. um, I know, I know people are starting to talk about uh, synthetic fuels mm. um, for uh, airlines. I think um, there was an article a couple of weeks ago, maybe in regard to Qantas, that it's just unaffordable mm. on, on a mass scale. Right. Um, but we can take that on notice and Patrick and the team can have a look more into that maybe for the next presentation. Yeah, very good. Okay, we will do. Thank you. Greg Johnson asked, what does the panel see as the current and expected future barriers in the air freight industry? Well, I think uh, the, the industry is still desperately short of pilots. Mm. <laughs> and with global passenger demand supposedly continue to increase and accelerate, and with China opening up, and then the changes in economics, particularly towards Southeast Asia, that there is supposed to be some horrendously large number of pilots and crew um, to be um, brought into the fold. I think that's the first one. The second thing is we still know um, in the back quarter of last year, the pilot turnout from the Western military. So a lot of commercial pilots in Europe and North America come from the military. Yeah. It saves them their cost, it saves them training. They do their 10, 11, 13 years. They're only in their early 30s. They get out of the military, they move on. But the militaries read into this what you will, are paying big bonuses for people to stay in the military. Mm. So there's not the pilots coming through. And that, if you speak to the airlines, that is one of the big issues. How are they going to fund this growth in, in human capital? Mm. Then production, and it was it, we put it in, and we can send that again. We put it in one of the snapshots. The production of 787s and A350s for demand, particularly for a greater Asia and India, is incredibly slow. Mm. Incredibly slow. So it'll be human capital. There's no one to fly them. Mm -hmm. And then there's no new planes, and they don't have the right engine technology because of emissions. Yeah, right. Fascinating challenges. Look, we're running short of time and questions are starting to come thick and fast. And, and there are a bunch of questions that are really quite interesting, but we just haven't got time to. We might sort of answer some of those uh, um, directly to the people that have asked them because uh, they're great questions. And, and, and uh, if anyone does have any further questions, um, you know, you can always uh, at any time email us at supplychain.austrade.gov.au. Uh, in, in the last minute, here, here's a quick one. Um, so, in your view, oh, they're jumping around here on my screen. In your view, sorry, Diane, I can't, I, I won't embarrass myself with your surname. Um, um, in your view, what would be the three key points of advice for commodity exporters? Well, you all need, everyone needs more friends. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I think it has a change. We all need more friends. So, particularly if you're a smaller exporter, uh, in tonnage, mass up, LTL really hurts, it's very costly, so whether it's air freight or sea freight, LTL hurts. So find more friends who are like-minded or have similar products. Um, you're consolidate. Not, consolidate, aggregate, 
try to mass up, get bigger rebates, be more predictable, uh, try to pre-buy. I know that's very difficult, particularly if you you don't know what your production of a crop is or what the weight of an animal is when you're going to kill it. Um, but you need more friends. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing is learn more about the numbers every day. Mm -hmm. Learn more about fuel surcharges. Learn more about other general price rises. Learn more about um, sea box container charges. I know that a lot of the freight forwarders who I love dearly when you're on there, so don't ring me straight after this and say you're not loved, um, ha having to pass through charges, extra handling charges, extra handling car charges, uh, extra charges for sea boxes, demur there's a lot of demurrage around, etc. An exporter needs to know their charges and their costs and have full visibility of that and don't lock yourself into fixed fuel componentry. Mm. Mm. If you're locking yourself into fixed fuel, uh, and then fuel floats on the other side, dear supply, you're in trouble. And I think the third thing is, um, I think the third thing is we, ha we have to keep being more efficient. Thing things like Austrade will help that. Things like the STS, Simplified Trade System, we need to be more competitive. Um, we need to think about how, as business and government, we're much more competitive. Talking of efficiency, we've gone over time. I do apologise, I didn't chairman's, manage that well. Chairman's fault. So they're chairman's <laughs> fault. We've got some great, we've got some great questions there. Uh, look, we really appreciate Michael for your insights. It's fantastic. Ash, thanks for coming along, for sharing fascinating thank insights you. there. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, once again, supply chains at austrade.gov.au. If you have any other questions, monitor our website. Make sure that you're getting our uh, our snapshots and you're on the email distribution list for that. Uh, and we thank everybody. We thank in particular the team behind the, t the, the, the team here uh, for the fantastic work they do. Uh, Patrick was uh, shouted out. Uh, we've got Tom, Max and Annika on, on the screen. You might be able to see as well as Jack Ajar. So thank you, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Bye for now.